Thank you very much, Kathy. That was very gracious of you and, uh, and long, and I'll, I'll uh, dispense with any other introductory remarks. Um, I'm really honored to be asked to give a keynote uh, in front of this many people on a topic that is so central to what you're going to do for the rest of the conference. And um, in honor of that keynote thing, I'm not going to give you the normal PowerPoints with 500 you know, bullet points and a recitation of what's going on, because I think you'll, you'll get that at the rest of the conference. What I want to start with is really to give you the benefit of about 20 years worth of work at the intersection, and this is going to be the theme, at the intersection of privacy, cybersecurity, data security, law, policy, processes, business stuff, all, all that stuff. I've, I've lived, the, the way to sum up what I've done in the last 20 plus years is I've lived at the intersection. And, um, and that's, I want to give you some lessons from living at the intersection because I think what you all are doing as security professionals in the education industry, sector, profession, discipline, is really um, going to, your success is going to be dependent on how well you thrive at that intersection and how you manage the intersection between what you do and what your other colleagues are doing within your organization or institution and outside. So that's what I'm basically going to do. Um, hello, people on the on the web. Um, this is, I guess, very interactive. So you can submit questions, and somebody will represent your questions. And anybody in the audience, if you feel like raising a hand and asking something, please do that. I'm I'm very happy to stop and pause there too. Um, so the technology is working, which is really good. Um, and the the theme really is collaboration, living at the intersection, and what it takes to do that is really team building a team. And so. Um, before I get started into the lessons, um, I want to talk a little bit about what, why the landscape is so hard. And uh, I'm not going to recite Mandian statistics, yay. I'm not going to recite Verizon report statistics. I'm not going to do that. You know all of those. Um, but uh, what I will say is um, I don't know how many of you get to go in front of boards of directors or testify in front of Congress or talk to CEOs. So that's kind of what I do. That's, that's my shtick, right? And, um, and I've frequently been called upon to be um, a representative of a team or the translator for those who need some kind of um, simplification of concepts that come so easily to those who are trained in, in areas and really expert in them. And I want to I give you that perspective and tell you why where we're living today is frankly terrifying, concerning. You know, pick, a, pick an adjective. I don't want to get too flamboyant about it, but it is very serious. And um, example of, of the seriousness of it that's not coming out of a, one of the, the vendor reports is um, I was at, the, uh, um, at, at, a, at a ceremony in, in February uh, of, uh, at the White House. So I'll drop names. I was at the White House on, um, in February for the release of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, how many of you have looked at the framework? Everybody in the room. Everybody on the web, I'm sure. So, so this is a pretty, you know, you can argue about what it really means and how effective it will be, but I, I happen to think it's a very consequential document, and I'll tell you a little bit more why later. But I was at the um, ceremony, and this thing was announced, and, you know, there were a lot of, there were several CEOs, there were several cabinet secretaries, and the chief of staff of the White House gets up and, and gives the introduction. And he said, you know, there are... Um, there's one thing we can all agree on from the White House perspective, from the administration, is that cybersecurity is one of the only systemic risks facing the United States. One of the only systemic risks facing the United States. And I thought that was very telling. Um, the, the declarations have been coming in a very blunt way about how significant these issues are that we're all addressing in our own institutions. Um, there are only a few others that are systemic, maybe global warming, maybe a few others. Uh, but this one is systemic. And the realization, the public discussion that's been had the last several years about uh, what to do about post-breach target, that target is the target reference, um, target has terrified boards of directors, your bosses, your management, your, your administrations to say, are we doing enough? Are the people on my team, up to the task, what do we need to do, and how do I explain what we're doing? 
that is absolutely part of the landscape now in a way that even five years ago, three years ago, was, but not quite as much as it is. And it really, it, 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 it makes people kind of in between, betwixt and between. Because on the one hand, you do have the targets and the, um, the, the University of Maryland uh, incident and others that affect individuals, individual records that might have been or were re reasonably supposed to have been compromised. And so you get to go public with those because of the laws in the United States that require disclosure, which I assume everyone here is uh, familiar with. But you know, if you have a penetration and reasonable, you know, you, you have a reason to believe that records about individuals that involve credit card numbers or financial data are compromised, you have to go public. A very unique invention of the American legal system, by the way. We started it. Other countries are now taking that in and saying, oh, that makes sense. I'll do that too. Um, so that's, on the one hand, you get that interplay and you get people coming to investigate and maybe sue you. Um, there's a plaintiff's bar now, again, an American invention, plaintiff's bar that's saying, hmm, that's interesting. But on the other side of the kind of thought process, and frankly, on the other side of Capitol Hill, are those who are really focused on nation states. They're really focused on geopolitical issues. And they're focused on um, China, other geographies. They're focused on um, controversies. For example, the Ukraine uh, tensions have had a cyber element to them. And they're really focused on what do you do to incent and support behavior by the private sector, including education, to protect intellectual assets? And how do you incent collaboration and make everyone feel like they got to do their best and not be penalized by coming forward and saying, we've got issues, we've got a vulnerability, we've got heart bleed and we're remediating and we've got some issues. And you kind of get a landscape where you're, in the United States in particular, where you're caught between um, those who are looking at identity theft and really want to and reinforce the fact that everyone's got to have good security and we got to go deal with breaches in a fairly significant um, punishing sort of way. And, and the rest of the issues, which are let's, let's all collaborate and get better at security. And it's a very, very challenging place. And those who are sitting in positions of having to allocate resources and make decisions are, are, are struggling to figure out how do you do the right things? How do you do what their security folks are telling them to do, their privacy folks are telling them to do? But, but keep in mind this landscape. So that's, that's a, a backdrop. And the, the reason I, I guess I'm asked to do these kinds of talks is that I've been around for a while and I've lived in this intersection. And so my background is I was an engineer, went to law school, did a little bit of law, but then kind of backed into the privacy space when I was asked to figure out what to do about privacy back in the mid-90s when the web emerged as a medium of business. And that's how I got into security, because I backed into it. Because once you got, I got to be appointed a, a privacy officer, I think I'm the first in business, I guess, Fortune 1000 at least. And what does it mean to be a privacy officer? How many of your institutions have somebody doing privacy? About 30%. How many of you do the privacy work? Almost as many. So I think frequently it lands with IT security, information security, and that's fine. But sometimes it's not. Um, and you could tell sometimes as organizations mature, they actually start splitting them apart um, because they're actually kind of different. And that's what I what I discovered over time is that they're very different. But at the same time, if you're going to need somebody to pull it together, you know, you you, you end up gravitating and, and putting the two together sometimes. And that's what happened to me. So I was doing privacy um, as a privacy officer, and then I started getting calls around 2005, right about when the first data breach notification law was enacted in California. I said, you know what? We seem to have an issue here, an incident. Can you help us? I thought, well, well you know, I guess so. Um, that's data security, and then eventually cybersecurity. And so my first lesson is, um, a lot of us do this together, but there's actually a big difference between and amongst these concepts. And it's useful to have a sense of what the differences are and what the terms are. So just for purposes of our discussion, I'm going to just kind of give you my definition. And I, I would source the definitions from useful authoritative places. And I, I start with right now the, um, there's a uh, NIST framework, has great definitions. The NIST framework draws from uh, White House documents that I think are pretty good because they reflect a lot of stakeholders. 
useful to start there. But cyber, um, basically, the, the policies, the, every technique you do to secure IT systems, digital systems that have data and that are used to undergird our, our society. Uh, data security, protection of the information on those systems. Privacy, policy decisions mainly. Policy decisions and actions you take to deal with information about individuals. And more broadly, when you're not talking about data privacy, you get into the broader concept of privacy, which, which I won't get into here. But basically, there are differences. And one um, way to think about it is that you can't really have data privacy unless you have data security and cybersecurity. You can't really have data security unless you have a reasonable degree of cybersecurity, because the data isn't going to be safe unless you secure the, 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 the systems on which it's, up, it's, it's resident and on which it flows, right? Um, but you can have cybersecurity without having either of the others. But then why bother? Why bother with it? Because then you're not securing assets that matter and that you're not um, maybe protecting values that have come to matter to us as, as society. So that's a, a way of thinking about the relationships between the, uh, among the three concepts. The other, though, lesson two, um, over time, I've, I've kind of figured it out that um, there are lots of places with people with very deep uh, expertise and opinion, um, lots of situations where you end up spending a lot of time debating what these terms mean. I don't know how many of you have been in these discussions, but I, I have a friend who's involved in, um, she's a federal regulator. And she can't really tell me the details, but she tells me that she's in charge of an interagency task force trying to come up with um, um, standards, new, new cybersecurity-related standards that will be influential. Um, but she's telling me about these interagency meetings, and they are spending, she said, um, a lot of time debating the meanings of words like cybersecurity, privacy, in other words, that have been defined many, many times by the administration that, that is responsible for this work. Um, that's an example. How many of you have been in standards efforts where you spend a lot of time doing this? And I've been inside organizations, I've advised organizations where you could see that there's a lot of delay in trying to get a team together and go work on an answer, work on a solution, um, because you're spending a lot of time saying, you know what, I got my definition, I've got you know, information governance. Let's not get off on a detailed discussion about what does that mean? information governance, and everyone has their view, and everyone's got their In order to put a team together, you've got to settle on some common ways of rough cuts of what, what you're working on, what the terms mean, what the ideas are, but don't spend too much time, or else you're going to eat up the time, and those who are waiting for answers um, will come back and say, well, what's taking so long? So that's one thing, and then if you're going to put a team together that's going to do data governance or data security or security, um, part of the other issue is, you know, boundaries. If you've spent a lot of time figuring out who's, who's doing what and kind of guard them, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to add time. So it really, the answer to some of the big challenges facing us are um, not to spend too much time on this, but then, you know, not to ignore them either. Um, why, did, why did they, why did the folks at Educause asked us, asked me to talk about team, building a team? Uh, I think one of the, the, the theme for the conference is uh, mind tricks and other strategies. So I think this falls into the context of other strategies. Um, I know that education is unique. I know that the kinds of organizations that you all are in um, lend themselves to decentraliz decentralized actors, right? And, um, but at the same time, you've got responsibilities that cut across. They cut across departments, they've got across institutions, maybe even campuses that are, that are very large. And um, part of the, o the only answer really is to build a team. And I'm not talking, I think I was talking to dinner, at dinner last night with somebody from, from the audience. Um, I'm not talking about building your team. I mean, yeah, that takes time, that takes skill to identify the people who are gonna really be part of your core team. I'm talking about team across your institution and team across across institutions, so like in Educause, you know, identifying those, those folks who you can work with to get something done. Um, and collaboration like that is really useful. Sometimes it can be a total waste of time. So in the, in the context of cyber and privacy, the trick is to, to know which one to use and, and when to use it. Sometimes if you're going to deploy a particular technology, I get it. You need a project management plan and you've got to go do it. Um, but if you're going to be deploying something or doing something that's controversial, that has policy implications or privacy implications, pause and figure out who else needs to be part of that. And there's a, 
in the education space, not, not in higher ed particularly, it's a, a, a new entrant, is an example of, of a privacy-related issue that got an organization caught in a, in a bind. Um, I don't know how many of you know the, the organization In Bloom, if you've heard of In Bloom. Um, uh, Gates Foundation, another foundation, invested $150 million in the creation of a uh, company that was intended to create and, and offer middleware, cloud-hosted middleware solution for storage and management of education records. The clients of InBloom were supposed to be school districts. And um, so launched with a fanfare, um, going to revolutionize educational records because you can put them in the cloud, school districts and schools, and you could track student performance and teacher performance longitudinally over time, which is a value proposition that is uh, something many people find very valuable, very, very useful. Others think not so much. And in Bloom, after operating for a few years, just shut its doors, kaput. Why? Several reasons. One of the reasons were, um, from the outside looking at the situation, backlash and a concern about privacy. And it really became evident that they had not built enough of a team outside of their organization that said, you know what, Here's, this organization's doing something good and they have some protections in place and we know about what they're doing, we help them do it, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of collaboration, if you're gonna embark on a, an initiative, was, was not quite there. And uh, it, got, it got to them. So that's a, collaboration is, is, a, is a really important uh, point of knowing when to do it, when to build the ecosystem. Now, uh, I mentioned in Bloom, um, because I was trying to figure out what are the examples here that a absolutely are resonant and unique to education as a sector, um, privacy or security. And in Bloom is definitely one of them. Um, the other is, you know, some of the re recent breaches. There's a uh, if you ever need ammunition or ever need um, information about what's going on in education in terms of breaches, I don't know how many of you know the uh, Privacy Rights Clearinghouse site or Pogo Was Right uh, website. Um, it is kind of a funny name. But, the, uh, but these sites actually, you know, I, I don't see any better for identifying pub where you can find information about publicly disclosed data, data security uh, events, breaches. Um, you can actually sort or go through those for inst uh, incidents involving institutions of whatever sector, right? So inst educational, um, educational institutions. And you go through them and you kind of pick up patterns. And education is, is kind of unique. I mean, the threat actors that go after you all um, most frequently are your own folks, right? So uh, you get a lot of careless behavior that can lead to breaches, that's for sure. That's why awareness is so important, and so, you know, user engineering. Um, you might get insiders. Insiders, I, as I understand, now I am gonna kinda go to the Mandiant and, and you know, uh, vendor reports, but I, you know, and from my own experience, the insider issue, because of what you've got in, in your institutions, is, is a very serious issue. Not, you're not unique in that. A lot of other sectors that have valuable data are, are, are definitely targets of that, but, but your, your institutions are pretty special. And, but your institutions also are ones where it's likely to, you're likely to be able to isolate and find the crown jewels a little bit more easily, maybe than companies, which are more diffuse and have multiple instances of, of some of these pieces of data. Um, so, so, so that insider vector is definitely something uh, that's very significant for your sector. And then, um, Whatever else, I, in terms of outside actors coming in, what are people really trying to get at with, with your, your sector in terms of um, security? You know it better than I do, but you've got some, you know, the, the, the intellectual assets that you have are really key. And then, you know, student identities or personnel identities. You've got a lot of people. Educational institutions are all about people, and you've got those assets. And, you're, and the, the sector is known, unfortunately, as being one of the easier targets. So while you're not a bank, you're not um, some of the companies I work with that are um, maybe more um, significant targets. Um, you certainly have the right profile to continue being a, a target and continue being a 
um, a victim of these breaches. So that's, that's one aspect on the security side. What makes you unique in the education arena is probably more interesting, I think, um, because there's, there's going to be a fair amount of attention on education, I think, in the next five years. And there are a lot of forces that, that drive that. In Bloom is an example of, a, of an organization getting caught in an interesting combination of, of factors. Um, first is that education, like medicine, like other areas which are a little bit slower to pick up and uh, adopt new technologies, or to do it in a way that's kind of um, maybe more vetted, um, education is ripe. You're, 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 you're seeing your institutions adopt cloud platforms. You're getting um, social platforms introduced into your environments, potentially without you're getting too much uh, control over, over who's using what. So you're getting more consumer-type platforms coming into your institutions. Um, you've got some regulation that covers data privacy or privacy in, in education, some. But there's a fair amount of momentum building in Washington uh, in particular, but also at the state level, that whatever exists is not enough to protect student privacy, and it's not enough to protect the security of information that you all have, you all, your institutions have, to which you have access, and to which, for which you have management responsibilities. There's a very significant amount of concern that's built up over the last five years. Um, there have been briefings uh, where Senator, a couple of senators, Senator Kerry, others have, have talked about this. They've focused on K through 12. They've talked about higher education. Uh, the, the breaches involving respected institutions haven't helped matters. And so you're sitting in a situation where you have now that concern front and center, driven by data security breaches, but also by this notion that there's new technologies and that institutions aren't spending as much time in oversight deciding whether or not to vendor certain solutions, certain data, um, and then once they do, keeping, keeping a handle on it. That's, I think, palpable. And so that's what will drive changes in law and then changes in standards that might come out from those who fund. Um, as a result of the NIST framework and other activities going on in, in government, a lot of the funding that will come out of the federal arena will have new conditions tied to it, I believe. Um, that will talk about, you know, show us your security plan. Demonstrate that you have put in place the elements of recent education department guidance on using outside vendors for, you know, cloud services, that sort of thing. And I think that is inevitable. And that's what makes the sector um, not unique, but you'll see change happening in this sector as it's happened in others. Um, so I think that that's coming. But in the main, you know, actually, the, or not here, and what is not um, unique, is that what's happening to other sectors too. It's not, it's not unique to education, but the fact that you've got so many stakeholders and that you've got decision-making processes in your institutions that are pretty diffuse um, means that you have to have a lot of collaboration, a lot of consensus building as you figure out how to deal with them. What's your position on legislation? What's your position on these standards? How do you take standards that are supposed to be imposed and then socialize them and get support for them? All of that points to the need to, to build consensus. Um, and I've talked about proposals. Um, I've talked about other NIST, uh, the NIST framework incidents. Um, the other tried and true technique, a trick, it's not a mind, a mind trick, but it's another strategy, is, um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you scan the social media or the press on your phone or every day. You know, I think the, the folks I'm working with, I may with CSOs, lawyers, and you know, risk managers. That's that's who I work with these days, client base. And what I what's been very successful, I find, is you kind of wake up in the morning, um, early early morning, see what's happening out there. It's a, it's a new breach, it's a new lawsuit, it's a new proposal. Something is something happened. Um, maybe the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission for those companies that are publicly held. What the SEC says is really important. So whoever is announcing something or saying something is to take that and plug it right back to the company management. I don't know how many of you do that or make a habit of it. You don't want to overdo it, but really good trick, a strategy is to say, that's happened there, right? So if you're not using the University of Maryland incident or other things in your sector and say, look at what happened, or I've been to Educause, here's what this peer group has said, or here's what I learned about this, 
is using that judiciously is very effective. It's very effective to attract resource, to justify resource, to justify and inform what your, what your story is going to be. You know, a, thou, a story is worth a thousand words. Uh, you know, one picture is worth a thousand words. A story is worth two thousand words. Because an example will get some, you know, get, get your folks, get your leadership wondering and, and thinking that that's something they might do too. It's not always going to work, but it's, a, it's a, for sure useful. And in terms of looking for guidance, and other external developments. I think um, the NIST framework, I'll, I'll come back to now and spend a little bit of time on this, because I actually do think it's a, a very useful tool, even if you're not considered to be part of the critical infrastructure. And um, uh, I'm, I'm actually curious to, to think, to, to ask you, I mean, do you all think that the institutions of which you're a part are part of the critical infrastructure? Do you, how many of you think you are a part of the CI? And it's a weird question, I know, because it's, um, you can have different parts of your institution. So about 15% of you um, sort of raised your hands. <laughs> and that's about the state of the definition of critical infrastructure right there. Um, it's, like, it's a little like pornography. You know, when you see it, you kind of know it, to, 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 to paraphrase a famous uh, Supreme Court justice in case. And, and that's really kind of why the NIST framework is actually a useful tool. So um, when, uh, in February, when the, when the Obama administration released uh, out of NIST, the National Institutes for Standards of Technology, the framework, it did so after a year, exactly a year, of a stakeholder process that involved about 3,000 people. And um, I don't know if any of you were part of the workshops that were held, the framework was in, is intended by word, by, by black and white, to apply and be used by the, cyber, by the uh, critical infrastructure, those industries who are part of the critical infrastructure. So the, the framework resulted out of an executive order the president signed back in 2012. It said, basically, the, the politics around that executive order were, um, for the first term of the Obama administration, the administration was building its position on cybersecurity. I was thinking about, do we need legislation? It came up with a position, said, we need law. And there's a kind of a, a, a write-up of what the law should be. But at some point in 2011, 20, early 2012, the administration concluded, no, we're not going to push legislation. We, we don't, we're not going to do it. And so the, the political play was in the State of the Union address in 2012, Obama, the president, talked about cybersecurity and said, basically, I signed an executive order. I'm going to do, we're going to do as an administration what we're going to do, and then we're going to now wait for Congress to do more. So the administration, the strategy that the administration is on is basically doing what can be done under current law within, within its power, within the, the agencies, and waiting for any other laws for Congress. That's basically the posture that you can expect for the rest of this term, this, this administration, see what next, what next might bring. Um, that should tell you something about don't wait, don't, don't expect too many new laws. Actually, don't expect any new laws in privacy or security unless something really consequential happens, at which point then we're talking about a kind of a 9-11 kind of a situation. So that's the landscape. The executive order that was signed in 2012 said, okay, here are all these things we're going to do, six or seven different areas one of which was let's get a new framework out there. And we're going we're gonna to mobilize and use NIST, which is a very respected agency, to mobilize and take a framework that will be voluntary, but that can apply to any critical infrastructure sector and anyone else who wants to use it. 3,000 people get consulted, stakeholder things, and stakeholder sessions, and you take all of the ISO, NIST, uh, other security standards, and you, you boil them down to what is a document that can be used by a board of directors, by management, by the CIO, the CISO, and anybody else in the organization who wants to kind of track and say, how are we doing on managing cybersecurity risk? And that document that was issued a year later right on schedule is like 45, 50 pages and is actually pretty, pretty good. I can read it. I actually help you know, input to, to it. So if, if you, know, you can have lots of different type of people looking at it and using it, it becomes a, a Rosetta Stone. It's like, so you can use it to translate. 
Lots of people can look at it and say, oh, I get, I get what that means. And so the simple words <clears throat> that are used to describe the basic, basic activities Go, I go back to the point about let's not argue about definitions. They could have used different words. They could have used a lot better words, probably. I, I think so. Um, they have these like one word descriptions of the first thing you do in managing cybersecurity risk is identify. Identify. What the hell does that mean? Identify. Um, I want you to kind of dig into it. So, oh, what they mean is identify the risks and then identify, because they had to keep using the word identify, identify all of the assets that you have in your, the information assets you have in your in your uh, domain, in your, in your organization, which is really hard. Nobody really knows exactly what they have, but that's, they say, you know, make an attempt there. And they keep going, identify things. And then detect, and defend, and recover. And, and those are the words, the one word, one word descriptions of the basic things you need to do. Why is that powerful? For you all, it's, it's silly, right? You know much better uh, what the elements of a security program need to be. You can go to much more sophisticated tools. But you know what? Sit inside a board of directors or sit and answer your provost or your chancellor's question if you've ever, if you ever been in this situation. They say, well, tell me, how are we doing in our security program? And explain to me, because I'm not very technical, explain to me um, what, what are the ingredients that go into a good security program? I don't know how many of you have ever gotten that question. I have gotten it a lot of times. Recently, I mean, I've, I've been consulting more on the consultant side the last couple of years. Um, I'd never got it inside a company because we already kind of knew that. But on the outside, I've been, I've been consulting and talking to a lot of senior people. The first time I ever got that question, I froze. Because I, I was so deep into what I knew and thinking. I, and somebody asked me the simple question, and I kind of looked at them, and I thought, you know, how do I answer that? Do I start talking about the law? Do I start talking about the elements of the ISO you know, 27,000 framework? Do I start talking about COVID? Do I use this and that? And I realized if I had opened my mouth and went, if I had gone down that road, I'd have lost them within a second. And they would not have understood what I was saying. And they would say, OK, well, that's nice, but I got to go figure out now what I can understand enough and then to go figure out how to make decisions about and make funding decisions, particularly about. And what, the, what, the, what this Rosetta Stone, what the NIST framework does for all of us as a community is, is it helps us not have to come up with definitions and words on our own and then worry about them and all that. We just, I think, I think suspending the desire to, to make your own for a second. Um, if I were in, if I were appointed, newly appointed a CISO or an IT security person, which I won't be, but if I were, um, or if I was counseling one, which actually more likely happens. And they said, well, you know, how do I explain what I want to do? I said, well, you know, take these words, take these, this kind of checklisty thing, which, which is kind of a guide. It doesn't, you have to do all of it. And say, you know, here's this authoritative uh, summary of what the world, in the United States at least, what the, what the United States currently expects to be in a security program. And look at it and say, you know, have, you know, we're going to be expected to have identified our risk and identified our information and our assets and have done certain things. We are expected to um, um, detect attacks and be able to defend against them. And if we are hit, we are expected to have certain mechanisms in there to recover, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we're expected. Those are the ingredients of a successful security program. Um, that is plain English. Makes sense? And it's tied to an external standard that it's not mandatory, but it's actually, eventually, because of the, the landscape here and the challenges, it's, it's likely to be something like it is coming. Maybe not, not in the next couple of years, but eventually there'll be something there that says, you know what, there is a standard of care to which organizations will be held in the critical infrastructure or anybody who even gets close to being considered to be important. Um, and that's why, that's why I, th I think this is, you know, not legal advice, but practical. It's like look for something you can hang your hat on. And maybe EDUCAUSE has other guidance um, to use. But this is something that is sufficiently general and high level that you can hang your hat on. And whether or not, you know, some of aspects, some elements of your institutions likely will be considered to be vital, critical. And when the... Um, when the, when the administration released the framework, they, they had it actually snuck in there, a, kind of a definition of critical infrastructure that was uh, even more expansive and mind-blowingly so than other similar pronouncements. So it's basically anything that anybody thinks is important or relies upon. 
is critical infrastructure. So if, if in your community, your organization somehow plays that kind of role, somebody's going to say, well, you, you really are important. Um, so, you know, I think when, when clients ask me, are we critical infrastructure or not, you know, I've actually just, uh, you know, several months ago produced a memo that, tro that traced the history of that term. And it's kind of interesting to see the history. We don't have time to go into it here. Um, but, you know, there is a, there's a definition. It doesn't, it, there's nothing magical that happens if you think about yourself or talk about yourself as critical infrastructure. Um, might, it might, you might get regulation coming down the pike that sweeps in those who might be part of, you know, what the Department of Homeland Security considers critical. But at this time, for, for practical purposes, um, you know, the, the definition is pretty loose. So um, I have two more. Any questions or any, any comments, please get ready or pop up a hand if you'd like. Or I don't know if we're going to use, are we going to use mics? We're going to use mics. So get ready if you want to talk. Um, lesson seven, uh, FUD. I assume this is a technology crowd, so FUD is a, is a term you know. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, you know, this, this, this don't let fear, uncertainty, and doubt about law, particularly privacy laws, get in the way of doing what you need to do. Um, and I, here I'm, I'm really thinking about information sharing, the kind of information sharing that is um, commonly understood to be effective and useful in dealing with threat. And um, I actually was uh, talking to the NCFTA yesterday, uh, National Cyber, Foren Cyber Forensics Training Alliance, if you know them, um, in Pittsburgh. And um, they had asked me to come do a version of this discussion for them because what they had uh, seen is that um, law enforcement, forensics uh, folks, and others involved in response uh, were getting increasingly hampered by organizations and say, I can't share information because i got privacy concerns. I've got the, these issues. And it's been a barrier for a long time. But there's a lot more interest in information sharing now. There's a, there's a push to do it. It's in the NIST framework. There's a section that says, are you sharing information? There's legislation designed to try to encourage and, and alleviate the, the concerns here. People understand that it's something useful to do. But then if you go and try to do it, you know, people like me and organizations will say, wait a minute, did you think about this? Did you think about that? What about privacy? And there can be some absolutely valid issues, totally valid. But what is useful here is, is really educating people what, what really is useful to share. I mean, most of the information you want to get out or get is not personal information, so there really is no privacy concern. It's much more technical and signature type stuff, right? Um, so education is part of getting rid of the FUD. Um, other, other tech, techniques would be to, you know, get help to figure out, you know, is there really an issue? Because, you know, I, I don't know how many times this happened to you, but I go, uh, sometimes I have a, an elderly mom, and I have, authority, I have a power of attorney uh, able to get information about her health care. I'm, I'm completely authorized. Um, it takes me, every time I go to a new provider or see somebody who doesn't know me, um, it, it, I either get one of two things. They, they kind of disregard and just give it to me without even asking to see my power of attorney or anything like that, which is one, one bad thing. Um, but then most of the time what happens is, uh, no, you can't have that. HIPAA tells me I can't give it to you. I said, well, here, here's this and this and that. I said, HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. And they just, they, they have the bureaucrat answer, which is uh, there's, there's something, I don't know what it is, but I can't take a risk because something here says I can't. But if you read a little bit, no, 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 I can't. And that's really human nature. It's, it's, it's a time-saving risk mitigation strategy on an individual level is to say no, because there's this, this thing I've read about and there are penalties associated with it, and I better say no. And that, I think, cre does help create an environment of FUD. You take that HIPAA example and make it applicable to others, and you get this, this in behavior in organizations. And really what um, my lesson has been, you know, that's where it helps to have you know, a couple of allies here to help say, no, no. No, I understand what you're saying, but no, this is really not that. It's this. Um, that kind of getting through and barreling through objections is, is really important to get stuff done. And that's why I conclude with my last lesson um, that's kind of, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a little self-serving, but the, uh, maybe, maybe a lot less self-serving, but, but the, uh, you know, my, my best friend and ally when I was inside the company was my colleague, the CISO the Chief Information Security Officer. Because um, you can't have privacy without security. So I couldn't do anything, frankly, without the benefit of and the collaboration of 
the IT and the IT security folks in particular. We, we were extremely close, both I as a counselor to them and a, and a kind of an uber risk manager, but they to me as colleagues who understood much more deeply than I ever will the, the process and the technology aspects that they were, they were undertaking on behalf of an institution that's very large. And now uh, what I see is organizations that do have um, experts and leaders within them that are collaborating, if you grab on to a lawyer, grab on to your internal colleagues who understand the policies and the legal aspects that you, you do not, you're not specialized in, they can help you barrel through. I, I cannot tell you how many organizations I've gone to where it's the general counsel who is now sitting at these board meetings. General counsels go to all, almost all board meetings. They have a corporate secretary role, most of them. They sit in those board meetings. They listen to the discussion. CIOs typically are invited, but the general counsel are always there. And they hear about these issues, they take it back, and they're asked by the CFO or the CEO, could you go figure out if we're okay? Guess who they're gonna call? They're gonna call their friend inside lawyers. They're gonna say, well, you could, could you talk to these guys? Could you like figure out if they're on the up and up? Are they okay? And then, and then they come back and they, they put these issues on agendas. You get presentations going. Um, they can be very influential in elevating the issues and selecting and framing. And if you make friends and allies of those folks, um, they will take you places that you need to go to get your case and case made and your, 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 your agenda prosecuted. So that's why I think, you know, other than being generally a nice person and collaborating, um, that's why in, in institutions it's useful to have them as, as colleagues and friends. Um, anybody have questions or observations, maybe short ones, observations, questions longer, um, that you wanna, you wanna raise? Um, and they could be about um, legal issues, policy, other lessons, other observations, because I think we're almost at time. Anything from the web? Nothing from the web, okay. So what I've tried to do, any? Okay, so what I've tried to do is give you a, a kind of a, a sense of, of uh, context. I think the things to watch for, and by the way, I have a, we, my team and I have a blog if you're interested in, in more deep uh, kind of analyses of legal issues in the security or cyber area as they come up. We, we propose something about once every couple of days. Uh, it's called hldataprotection.com. Um, what, I, what I think is coming in, in this area in terms of legal and, and policy issues that, that teams ought to be aware of are um, watch data breach notification. I think we're gonna be coming and seeing a, a federal standard sometime soon. That is one of the pieces of law that um, will be likely to, to progress, um, if anything does. The other is watch the um, Federal Trade Commission. To the extent there is a regulator in the United States that talks about or looks at data security and data privacy, it is the Federal Trade Commission. Their authority under their, the laws that govern them has been uh, expanding because they've been suing and, and getting recovery and, and consent degrees with a number of different kinds of companies. Um, they are under challenge by a company called Wyndham Worldwide, it's a hotel company. Um, their authority is being challenged and they're now on appeal. Um, the FTC won the first round. That is also, I think, pretty consequential. Um, another area to watch is, or even to participate in, is self-regulation. Um, the, the, in the United States, the Obama administration is on record as supporting, and they are supporting initiatives to create <laughs> standards and self-regulation in not just security, um, but, but privacy in particular around things like, um, like online standards and uh, facial recognition, use of facial recognition technologies, which is, um, I don't know about your areas, but there are companies and organizations starting to use facial recognition as a way of authenticating for security purposes and for other purposes, you know, kind of physical security aspects. Um, there are some very interesting uh, self-regulation going on sponsored by uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce. And then watch your agencies. Your agencies, the ones that you deal with, whether it's funding or standard setting, uh, are going to be under pressure to do more in these areas. And they're going to be doing more, whether it's funding restrictions to wait for your programs or substantive um, restrictions or standards. That's coming too. And the only way to do it is to have a team.
to, to respond. So thank you very much for the, uh, for the morning, and have a great conference. Thank you.